All right, welcome back to PacWest Bigfoot. This is David, and <clears throat> let's clear the throat and get a little sip of that old Sasquatch coffee. I want to say thank you guys very much for being here, and uh, as I said, uh, or I'm going to say on Monday during an interview, I'm going to go ahead and switch up the announcements of each monthly winner from PacWestBigfoot.com for something free uh, right around the 10th or 11th of every single month, so pay attention to your email. And as soon as I send you that uh, email letting you know that you've won, I need you to get back to me within that week. Uh, I'm going to give you about five to six days. If I do not hear from you by then, then I will go ahead and announce a different winner. Okay, that's it. As a matter of fact, this week, uh, this uh, month's winner is going to win a uh, coffee mug and a, uh, a p an art print, actually, from uh, Cryptids by Sarah Bergman. Sarah Bergman. And also, I've got something special for you that I'll announce on Monday for that giveaway as well. So I actually got three things for you this time. All right, with that, let's get on to this week's Bigfoot encounter story from the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> Bigfoot raids cornfield near Yale, Washington. It's not really a massive cornfield, to tell you the truth, but it did take up part of a large section of the old farm I owned outside of Yale, Washington. And yes, Bigfoot eat corn like it's going out of style. About two decades ago, I was running a farm outside of Yale, and it, is fi and it finally became apparent that late September to the middle of October, for two years in a row, I would have a Bigfoot or several of, several of them raiding my back cornfield, and weekly at that. Here's what I saw and experienced in the mid-1990s. An ear full of corn and whooping. I wanted both a small corn maze for the upcoming autumn and the extra corn to sell at the farmer's market. My wife, of course, knowing it would turn a great little profit, agreed and even helped me plant it all. I know we love corn, and honestly, we can never get sick of too much corn on the cob. I've also come to believe that Bigfoot eat it too, and they actually love the stuff. So here's how it started. I think it was around 1994. Uh, I'm almost sure of the fact. Uh, in late August, I believe, if I remember correctly, the first of a small clan or family of Bigfoot moved in on my new corn and started eating it all. Well, much of it at least. And just so you know, I prefer to call them a family as my wife and I did get to see two of them, one larger one and two young ones, which I will share here. I planted the corn, like I said, to create a small but fun corn maze for the upcoming fall and Halloween season. Of course, the wife said we could sell the corn itself and clear out some decent extra income from it, and that made sense to me. So the corn maze would be free to run through, and the corn would go for the going rate out front and down at the farmer's market on Saturday mornings. We had pumpkins, too. Not a ton of them, but enough to generate a pretty decent income from the re for the rest of the winter in combination with the corn. I know today, years later, after selling the place, the farm is not a farm anymore, just a bigger, nicer home on a ton of property. Even when we owned it, it was more of a hobby farm than anything else. My wife is a dentist and does very well with her practice, and even back then, and I wanted to have <clears throat> even back then, and I wanted to have a hobby farm and contribute to the family income, and boy did it work. But I started noticing my corn being raided, like I said, back in September. Uh, it was, uh, I was an early June planter of corn myself to get as much as, po uh, as possible ready for the fall season. I found the stalks themselves were okay, but many several ears of corn were left strewn all over the place, and mostly around the backside of the area where the forest practically butted up against the field itself. Between the back side of the farm land, there is a space of about 40 feet where the forest begins. There are some or a few other farms around, but the, for the most part, it is forest or clear-cut past the old farm even today. Whoever it was had come at night, as I was uh, usually up just as the sun rose every day, even a bit before that most of the time, and had noticed the back field in a slight disarray. I remember heading back to the house and grabbing a flashlight to get a better look around at the mess. 
uh, and it seemed to be a real bad mess. On returning, I was right. Half-eaten corn was strewed about, and some stalks were even bent over, <clears throat> and a few unfortunately broke. I looked around for deer track, or bear for that matter. What I found was not only shocking, it was all over the place. Footprints. Bear footprints ran here and there throughout the back part of the cornfield. They were not large. Well, the first ones I would see that morning, at least, were rather normal in size, actually. It took me a few to figure out where they came from, as there were uh, so many I could not tell at first. But after a few minutes of chasing ghostly footprints, I stepped off into the grass just on the other side of the dirt and field and followed impressions in the grass to the edge of the forest. I was not going in there, even though at that point I'd figured it was just a bunch of teenagers stealing from me. It was still dark a bit in there, and I was not armed at the time. Hey, it might have been more than teenagers after all. Come to find out, it was. I left it at that and figured the kids got their fill of wrecking my crop and would be on their way and not coming back ever, I hoped. Boogeyman of the Corn my wife and I discussed what to do, and even back then, there was some pretty cutting-edge technology we could have used. But the cost was not worth the maze it was, after all. So we took the loss of a few bushels of corn and left it at that. The first week of October, and things got a little more serious. <clears throat> and the cost of some sort of protection system was, at that point, a major consideration. And we meant for the house and ourselves, forget the corn. It was morning, Monday morning in fact. I had decided to go and pick more of the corn and get it ready to sell by the road that same day. Again, footprints everywhere. This time, however, the footprints, and I measured them, were nearly 18 inches long. There were other sizes though. There was a 15 and a quarter inch and two, set, uh, two sets that measured 11 inches and one 10 and a half inches. Four boogeymen were raiding my field at night. I followed them to the edge of the forest, and this time I decided to arm myself. I came back fully loaded and headed in. They kept on going. I must have been, I don't know, 300 yards in before I hit a clear-cut area from years ago. I could see down into a ravine and back up a mountainside. I could not see any more impressions or footprints either. There was a few corn cobs tossed about here and there, so as I walked back to the farm, I picked up a couple. Huge teeth marks. It had to be by looking at how they were literally bitten in half and some of the wide marks that were left behind. I was starting to think I was not dealing with people, but actually with what, for me, was up to that point a legend in an old obscure film. My mind kept saying Bigfoot. My wife thought I was nuts at first, but even after she saw the footprint, she too became concerned we were dealing with something other than people. Of course, she being a dentist is reason enough to keep the experience to ourselves at that time. And even now, this is about as much about the experience we will ever say publicly. But my wife and I worried about these night visitors and wondered what in the world we could do about them, if we could do anything at all for that matter. Two really hairy kids. A few days later, and I decided to get some reading done about Bigfoot. Well, what I could get my hands on at the time that was not some nickel and dime store novel, that is. It only took half a day to finish the book, by the way. There is much more information out here today, I noticed, and that would have been nice back then. But the day after finishing the book, I decided to play Scarecrow. Okay, not Scarecrow, more like First Blood. <laughs> I had myself in the back, I hid myself in the backfield to see what or who is <clears throat> exactly was uh, was taking my profits. I only had to wait until the sun almost set that first evening. I could still see really well where I was. I climbed up a large tree about 25 yards away from the back field, and while I thought I was out of sight, I was not completely out of the way. I heard fast approaching footsteps from behind me, and that is when I turned slightly, enough to notice two small children, all dressed in black, running right below me and into the rows of corn. As my eyes adjusted to the little light, uh, to the, yeah, little light on the subjects, I noticed they were not wearing 
<clears throat> all black. In fact, uh, hair. It was hair. They were covered in thick black hair. My heart at that moment ended up in my throat, and I thought I was going to pass out after a second or so. But I hung in there, gathered my wits, and caught my breath, and continued watching them. They kept moving around, and rather quickly, so getting a good uh, view of their faces was not possible, but their body structure and mannerisms were easily noticed. Their arms were like many reports I've read, uh, uh, I in fact, state, and have in fact stated, longer in proportion to their body, or to a human body. They were long, almost four to five inches at least past their knees. <clears throat> From time to time, when they were still, uh, still at least, <clears throat> they would go to all fours like giant chimpanzees. Like I said, the hair was practically jet back, black, except one of them. The smaller one seemed to have a small, light gray streak of hair running down its neck to middle back. Other than that, they were jet black in color for sure. I could see that they were at least four to four and a half feet tall at most, the larger one being barely a few inches taller than the other. Their hands seemed pretty large as they grabbed more of my corn and bit them in half, eating them. Apparently they were picky too. Some they would pick, look at it as they turned it in their hands quickly and tossing some and eating others. I watched for at least what seemed a minute or so <clears throat> as they weaved in and out of sight in the rows of corn. But seconds later, fear would take place of the amazement and awe I was feeling at that particular moment. Tall, hairy beast. This one too seemed to glide as it stepped out of the, f out of the woods. From out of nowhere, almost, a giant hairy monster now stood on the edge of the cornfield straight ahead of me, about 35 yards to 40 yards away. Tall, hairy, and I could tell a massive body that just screamed out, Monster! Personally, I was surprised none of them had taken notice of me up to, the point, up to that point, but then again, I was in such awe and fear in the moment that I could not move if I had to. I was literally frozen in fear. Okay, maybe if I felt threatened I could have, but at that moment, I simply could not move an inch. Fear, however, while well, I was feeling fear at that moment, I saw what looked like a large monkey-like creature step out of the dark and into the late, faint light of dusk. The awe I was feeling of the little ones was gone, literally gone. Fear took its place. I watched as it... She, and you could tell by the breasts it was a she, started mumbling and motioning with her hand and lanky arms and hands at them as if she was telling them, Enough. <clears throat> it is time to go. The younger ones immediately stopped what they were doing. Then, at a rather fast pace, they glided with that weird walk right past her and into the trees. The female Bigfoot then looked around her and then stepped backwards a few steps into the trees, turned and disappeared herself. As if I was holding my breath for minutes, I let out uh, what was in my lungs, I remember, as well as a swallow, uh, uh, as swallowing my heart that felt lodged in my throat still. I had still not moved, and that was a real blessing, because all of a sudden I held my breath again, and this time my heart sank deep into my gut when I heard footsteps to the left of me. I thought the fourth... Bigfoot, or the footprints I'd encountered before, was now heading right for me. And judging how tall the female was, well, I was in pretty a pretty dangerous spot. Simply put, like it could reach up, grab me, break me in half, and eat me too, like the corn. I did not want to, but I looked back as the steps were so close I knew they were right behind me. It was my wife selling the farm. It was the most thrilling and scary event in my life to watch these things, how they moved, how massive the female was, and how powerful it looked. Just scary. My wife said she caught a visual of the young ones as they walked off, but missed the large female, her mother. It also freaked her out to no end, thus the reason to sell the place ASAP. My wife still loves the country and we still today live outside a small town, but not there, not on the old farm. After the second year in a row, when we spotted the things again, well, that was it for her. As thrilling and scary as it was to see such animals, I was not all that against moving either. Since then, I have read a lot about these things and have to say I'm looking forward to getting out in the field, as they say. 
However, when I retire in a few years from now, I'll make sure I'm careful. I'm still a little hesitant about doing some research. Once you see one, or several in my case, you know what it means to be a little fearful and scared of them. They are massive and move like lightning. In the end, you are not hunting Bigfoot. You may do research, but the hunting is what they do, not you. Thank you.